We will work to ensure there are no job losses as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, so says the federal government. And are states manipulating numbers of confirmed cases in a bid to get more money from the federal government? This is PLOS Politics and I am Felicity Ezewike. You're welcome to the program. In a May Day message, the federal government said it plans to ensure that there are no job losses arising from the extreme effects of the coronavirus pandemic on the economy. The Minister of Labor, Chris Ngike, in a statement released by an aide, said government would not encourage employers to disengage any member of their staff without the prerequisite social dialogue and clearance from the ministry. Joining us to talk about Ngike's statement and other labor matters are Rotimi Sakore, a journalist and development as well as policy analyst. He joins us via Skype. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we'll have a little later joining us the Deputy General Secretary of the United Labour Congress, Chris Onyeka. Uh, that will also be uh, by telephone. Uh, let's just get started. Thank you again for joining us, Rotimi. Thank you. All right, let's uh, start with uh, me saying happy Workers' Day. <laughs> COVID-19 has forced everyone, including the NLC, the TUC, the Minister of State, Head of Service, among others, to go online with celebrations, delivering message of solidarity on this day. I want to take your quick reaction first on this year's drastically changed celebration as with most celebration this year. Well, I was about to say that there is no, that there is no celebration. It, you know, it's, it's just workers' day. Okay. So, uh, mm. Is that all you have to say about the day, really? Yes, it's... Well, as it ha happens to be under the shadow of COVID-19, it's also an opportunity for workers to reflect on whether the right safety conditions exist for them to resume work on Monday in Lagos. Okay, so let's look at the statement um, issued by the Minister of Labor, reassuring workers to stay strong, and um, said they would work to ensure there are no job losses. Labor has already cautioned against retrenchment. How do you propose the federal government might go about ensuring this? But there have been job losses already. So the Minister of Labor is behind the curve. And as for whether there will be more job losses in the future, which sector is he talking about? Is he talking about private sector? Or is he talking about public sector? And even if they can guarantee in the uh, public sector, do have the small businesses especially received any support? that uh, will, will prevent them uh, from, uh, you know, firing people. You know, they, they haven't done anything of the sort. I mean, if you look at some of the other economies around the world, they are investing billions of dollars in supporting small businesses or even bigger businesses. Here, we, there, there is no clarity at all on any amount for small and big businesses or how it is going to be done. So if he says they will work to prevent, is it after COVID or next week? The minister is well behind the curve and he, he really needs to rethink you know, that statement as to whether it's appropriate or not. All right, um, I'm told we have um, Chris Onyeka, ULC uh, Congress, that's United Labour Congress, uh, joining us uh, via telephone. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right, I'll get you straight into the conversation as well. Um, according to the latest edition of the ILO Monitor uh, for COVID-19 um, and the world of work, among other things, issues that were raised were that working hours will decline by 6.7% in the second quarter of 2022, which is equivalent to the loss of about 195 million full-time jobs. 
with this information in the public domain, wouldn't it be more practical, uh, so to say, perhaps, uh, to suggest a clear approach to be employed towards reducing to the barest minimum uh, job losses rather than a blanket reassurance with no clear strategy? Okay, okay. Now, uh, basically, when you wear the minister's position, uh, it is um, the desire of every government to ensure that uh, jobs are not lost. Uh, if jobs are not lost, uh, it means that the economy, uh, uh, you know, will, will, remain, will remain buoyant because income will be guaranteed for certain uh, segments of the society. Uh, which does what stimulates demand and keeps uh, manufacturing activities uh, domestically going on. Now, but um, we have to go beyond wishful thinking because it is not just um, saying that you're going to uh, do something to ensure that jobs are not going to be lost. Jobs, like my brother who was talking to you before, did say, jobs are, are already on the line. You know, the banking sector are offloading people, aviation sector, they are offloading people. The informal sector uh, jobs are almost gone. And so you ask yourself, what would be the strategy to ensure that these jobs, you know, are no longer lost? And what are going to be the strategy for creating new jobs going forward? Now, what are the mitigate, some of the mitigating factors that could be used is to ensure that the jobs, okay, the companies that are creating new jobs are already, have already employed people are assisted to remain in operation so that they can return their workers. But when they return their workers, it means that those jobs will not be lost. And then they will be in a better position to create new jobs that will absorb new hands that will come into the labor market. And that is one of the ways. And how do you do that? How do you assist them? You can assist them either by by supporting them, you know, to pay wages, as is done in some other societies. They call them wage assistance mm. from the government. So the, the federal government can assist companies that are genuine employers of labor and assist them, pay a certain percentage of the salary of their wage bill to the workers. That is one way. But I believe that one of the best ways of doing that is to extend, you know, cheap loans. So these uh, uh, manufacturers, and also it's also important to stimulate, you know, medium to small scale empl employers, so that they can generate jobs okay. in some places. And then the informal sector uh, um, uh, companies or establishments, the people, the better. All right, let, let, let's, let's, let's uh, bring in uh, Mr. Sakure to the conversation again. Um, uh, the government has assured they are going to follow the policy um, response by ILO, the four-point uh, pillar that was uh, pr promulgated. Now, this government and previous like it um, have a checkered history keeping promises to labor. Do you see this pandemic experience maybe changing uh, the narrative for us? No, if we, if we are to work with the track record of the federal government, I don't see them improving in relation to their promises to workers or professional organizations. I mean, how many agreements has ASU, for instance, signed? And ASU has then had to agitate again just to have an agreement respected after it was well negotiated and signed, not a new agreement, an existing one. So just using ASU as an example, I mean, there is no track record to suggest that the government uh, is going to act on what they have said. Having said that, it's important to say that the government actually ups their game because unlike, uh, <laughs> unlike COVID-19, you know, AS ASU is not a virus. COVID-19 is a virus. So if they don't mitigate the, you know, the situation, you can't negotiate with a virus. Eventually, the virus will overrun the country, and the federal government will not have a, a country to preside over. If you look at the figures of COVID-19 from, say, the U.S., for instance, a, I mean, hundreds of thousands, a million, and that's because they are testing. We are not testing. 
All our cumulative tests at this point is less than 15,000. There are countries that have tested 5 million, 2.5 million. If we are to do that same number of tests, what, what would we find? So, yeah, so the, you know, the intervention to mitigate COVID-19, the intervention to support businesses, it can't be the same business as usual. If the government does not act with more integrity at this point in time, okay. they may have no country to preside over. All right, I, I want to, you're in the private sector. I want to take your thought on his comment that the government would discourage employers from um, disengaging any member uh, of their staff. And he says, th without any prerequisite social dialogue and clearance from the ministry, we actually mentioned that during the intro, do you think they might, how, do you think there is a way they are going to go about this uh, that will be effective? If, if they haven't started, they are behind the curve because private sector is already disengaging people. I mean, what they should have been doing two or three weeks ago, seeing what is happening in other parts of the world, because we have a head start. We had a head start. We could see what was happening in other parts of the world. They should have set up COVID-19 economic teams to start negotiating with the private sector, with employers, with workers and professional organizations to look at how to save jobs, palliatives, how to restart the economy. They had a head start. They could see it happening in other parts of the world. They didn't have to learn it themselves, and they didn't do so. And on May 1, they are saying that they will. They will, not that they have. I mean, obvious, I mean, if, if we look at what is happening so far, they are seriously unprepared. All we can urge now is prepare better, learn from what is happening in other parts of the world, set up the right economic COVID-19 economic committees, and start doing the engagements with the employers, with the employees, with the professional organizations, and put everything in place. Coming out today to tell us that they will does, does not suggest that the Minister of Labor knows what he's, what he's talking about. All right, let's bring Mr. Oyeka in again. Um, talking health and safety at work, he commended workers in the health sector particularly for being in the front line um, in, of this uh, fight. Now, the third yeah. policy response encouraged by the ILO was ensuring adequate protection for all those who continue to work during this crisis. This, the body said, requires guarantee for safety and health in the workplace. Now, we know that our health workers continue to test positive. As at last count, we had about 113 of them. What better measures should the government explore to guarantee to at least um, a reasonable degree the safety of workers in the front line? Yeah, it's, uh, we have laws, health and safety uh, standards that protect workers in the factories, in the places of work, the factories act. But the fact is that the federal government has regulations in place, but they do not have enough manpower to enforce it. Factory inspectors are, are key to ensuring compliance with the regulations. Now, because of COVID-19, companies were not complying with these laws because we did not have adequate number of factory inspectors to go around. Now that we COVID-19 is with us, and we are going back to work, probably starting from Monday, what new arrangements have been put in place? Have we had dialogue with them? No, we have not had dialogue with them. We are supposed to have multi-level dialogue at the national level, at the state level, and at the plant level to agree on the modalities for going back to work to ensure the health and safety of workers are maintained. We have already adopted a position that any employer that does not show us what it has done to ensure that the health and safety of our members are guaranteed as we reopen, as we attempt to reopen, we, we will not start work in those places. We will not encourage our members to go back to work in such places because we want to work, but we don't want to work to die. So if the government ensures that the standard, the existing standards, and most standards are, are, are different and are complied with, then that would uh, guarantee the safety of workers, not just the health, uh, health, the 
health workers, but also most of the people that are in the critical area they are the front line battling against uh, COVID-19. Um, the, the minister talked about the mobilization and allocation of human and financial resources without exacerbating the national debt crisis uh, we already have. I'll take this to Mr. Sakore. We are obviously borrowing in addition to the debts that we already owe. What's your take on our borrowing at this time? Uh, please, with your kind permission, if I may talk about just two or three sentences on the previous question. Oh, go ahead. M most of the frontline workers, health workers, are women. 80% or 85%, especially nurses, cleaners, uh, lab technicians, if a gender lens is not applied to the intervention for workers' safety, then obviously it's going to fail. You can see both the federal government task force and the state government task forces. They hardly involve the health workers, trade unions, or professional associations. They certainly do not include women's organizations or civil society organizations acting on behalf of women. And women health workers have many different needs from that of men. So unless that is done, I'm afraid that it's not going to end uh, very well. Regarding the question of uh, loans, can I just say that both the federal government and the state government have billions of naira in security votes. This is the time to bring it out. You don't necessarily have to borrow to fight every, every, every crisis. They have security votes. They don't appropriate it, appropriate it properly. In many cases, nobody, it's not clear how it is even spent or what it is spent on. This is the time to be transparent. Bring out that money, invest it in sustaining the economy, invest it in the safety of workers, especially the health workers, without which we are not, we are not going to emerge from this pandemic. The pandemic is going to be with us for about nine to 14 months. Uh, that, that, I, 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 you're not looking like um, there is optimism somehow with all the efforts with vaccine. Are we going to stay that long, really? No, the vaccine will not be ready in, in any shape or form before October or November. And then after that, it has to be manufactured to scale. And we are talking of six, seven billion units then it has to be shipped around the world. And then the public health logistics of each country will kick in in terms of deploying the vaccine. If, if we don't, I mean, just look at all the trouble we've gone through, just for polio, all for right. instance. Um, or, I, I don't or, want us or, to. Or, or, or just the routine vaccinations. Uh, you're making a valid point, but I don't want us to digress uh, so much um, out of what we're trying to focus on right now. So um, just to bring us back quickly, let's touch on federal government's approved, uh, uh, approval for the immediate measure of 102 federal agencies in line with the recommendations of the uh, Oronsai report. There are concerns that the proposed rationalization um, will lead to massive job cuts, but government says the general idea is that the heads of agencies will reduce and the number of people that earn big money will also reduce. There might be some job, uh, job losses according to them but not in the way that people are thinking. I want to hear your thoughts on this latest move by government. Well, first of all, the government lost a lot of time in acting on it. I mean, this report is, uh, what, 2011, 2012? We are in 2020. So, not just this government, but the previous one, has made us lose about eight to nine years in acting on it. In eight to nine years, you could have designed your plan much better. Now they are going to implement this under pandemic conditions. You are, they are going to make a hash of it. All right. Um, Mr. Onyeka. Yep. Okay, I want to I want to ask you about there is um, social media response to uh, the video of the Access Bank uh, PLC's decision notifying staff that it's going to cut salaries and uh, to avoid more job uh, losses. There are concerns about the bank's decision to donate one billion naira to the uh, federal government to fight COVID-19 when such could have been used to reduce the number of courts needed. Uh, some say this would have been 
there would have been a better approach to this. What's your take on this development? Uh, basically, you see, uh, within the employment uh, relation, uh, relations, we, we have frameworks that seek to mediate uh, some of these situations. Because the, these situations were understood, you know, to occur in a while within the uh, industrial relations framework. Now, what we do not encourage within uh, uh, the relationship between employers and, and workers is impunity or unilateralism. Uh, now, an employer has the right to, fire, to hire and fire. But then there, is, there are laws that guide how these, these are conducted. And then, as uh, is where we begin to talk about collective bargaining institutions and collective bargaining framework. Now, that, that companies want to coach or has already coach um, uh, jobs, you know, where was the law followed? You know, was the law saying that uh, if you want to exit a through so so and so so, okay, this is what you do? Was it followed? That is one thing. But most of these organizations, that are saying we want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, offload workers. But yes, you see the, 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 the paradox of giving money to the federal government, okay? And then they are telling you they don't have money. Look at most of the companies that are doing this. They are people that have reported billions of naira in profit. And they are telling you that they are suffering because of uh, the pandemic. Is the banking sector suffering because of pandemic? That is not true. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Yeka, I have to interject. I've been told we have less than three minutes on the program, but this question okay. is pretty important. What should workers be doing right now to help them uh, prepare or mitigate some of the fallout of these expected job cuts? We, we, are, we are already, uh, we, have, we have articulated our position, and this position we have sent to employers in the, the various sectors, we have also said to the federal government, like the Ministry of Labor, that the need for us to have a robust engagement, you know, within the industrial relations family before anything is done is important. We will not condone impunity. We are also preparing our members because we know that workers, you know, happen like this. Workers always fall victim, okay, to, uh, to impunities, acts of impunities by employers, both public and private. And so we're preparing our, our members to defend ourselves. We are not saying if you want to cut, if you want to tackle us, that you don't have right to tackle us, but we're saying you must obey the law. You must comply with the law. You must follow the procedure. And so we are doing that, and we are also conscientizing the Ministry of Labor on the need to enforce regulations. There are regulations that are there that must be followed. These regulations are to protect Nigerian workers. And they must ensure that these are followed. All right, and Mr. So, so we, are doing, we are doing all those, and we are prepared to do more. Thank you very much for joining us on the program. God bless you. Thank you for having me. All right, Mr. Zachary, uh, just in, in 40 seconds, if you can, your thoughts on what the workers can do at this time to help them uh, prepare to mitigate some of the challenges ahead. Well, I'm not sure it's incumbent upon workers to help uh, the government for the workers to lose their jobs. I'd just like to say that with respect to savings, it's best done at the very top. And I'm not just talking about, you know, the free house, free car, free food, free petrol, free travel, and free everything that the political elite get on top of their pay. I'm also saying that they are the ones that duplicated all these agencies to create jobs for the boys. So that's really where the savings can be made, not with the ordinary workers. All right. Thank you very much uh, for your thoughts so far. We'll be back with you in a moment. We'll take a short break now, and when we return, are state governments not being totally honest with the number of COVID-19 infections in a bid to access more monetary assistance? That's up for conversation to stay with us. <laughs> 